Uh, there is a handout again today. I uh, hope everybody got a copy. Again, I won't be referring to it directly very much, but it does contain the main points and any uh, longer quotations that I'm reading. Now, suppose that things are good or bad independently of any entities for whom they're good or bad. That is, suppose that the notion of good is conceptually prior to the notion of good for. Then what does it mean to say that something's good for you? Presumably it means that you stand in some important relation to the goodness of certain things. Focusing on aesthetic cases can make this option initially seem very tempting. La Travietta or Van Gogh's Starry Night or the Taj Mahal are good things. And to be the kind of entity for whom things can be good or bad is to be the kind of entity who is capable of appreciating exactly that fact about them. Because you're capable of appreciating aesthetic value, exposure to beauty is good for you, while having ugliness thrust upon you is bad. Because rabbits and squirrels are not capable of appreciating aesthetic value, or anyway not of the kind in question, operas and paintings and architectural masterpieces are nothing to them. The rabbit can appreciate the flavor and texture of a carrot, or the squirrel that of a nut, so these kinds of things can be good for such creatures. But on reflection, we'll see that in general, to say that something's good for you cannot mean simply that you're aware of or exposed to that good thing and appreciate the fact of its goodness. For suppose that the happy condition of those who are rich is a good thing. The poor may know about the happy condition of the rich and may very well appreciate its goodness. But even if the poor are very generous and are glad to think of the happy condition of the rich, they seem to stand in a very different relation to it than the rich themselves do. So it can't be that what's good for you is just to stand in the presence of the good and appreciate its good character. And there's another problem as well. Isn't the experience of appreciation or enjoyment itself also a good thing for the creature who's capable of it? After all, isn't it better to enjoy than to suffer or to appreciate than to be repulsed? And is that because a creature who is capable of appreciating things is also capable of appreciating his own appreciation or enjoying his own enjoyment? And then are these second order enjoyments and appreciations also good for the creature? And if so, what makes them so? There's clearly no point in starting off on that kind of endless regress. But if the capacity to appreciate or enjoy something is what makes it good for you, what does make appreciation and enjoyment themselves good for you? Now, that objection generalizes. Many people find it natural to suppose that what makes something good for you is that it makes you happy. But they also suppose that your own happiness is a good thing for you, for it's surely better for you to be happy than sad. Is that because being happy makes you happy? This little conundrum may be what drives people to the second of the two possibilities that G.E. Moore set before us yesterday. The view that what it means for something to be good for you is for you to have something good. Happiness, we might say, is a good thing in itself. And what makes a bit of happiness good for you is that it is yours. This solves the problem about why the happiness of the rich is not good for the poor, you might think, because the happiness of the rich is like the money. The rich and not the poor are the ones who have it. But actually, that's a little too hasty. What relation are we talking about when we talk about this having? The strange fact that we talk about moral matters in terms borrowed from economics, value, obligation, owes, and so on, may lull us into supposing that we have some clear notion of ownership to work with in this case. But the notion of property ownership is not going to help us out here, because to say that something is your property is to say that you may use it or enjoy it, and that no one else may use it or enjoy it without your permission. That's what we mean when we, when we talk about the rich owning the money. But it's not when we, what we mean when we say that the happiness of the rich is their happiness, and so not what we mean when we say it is their own good. Because even though the happiness of the rich is the good of the rich and not of the poor, the generous-minded among the poor are certainly free to enjoy the happiness of the rich if they can and don't need the rich's permission for that. It also seems odd to analogize happiness to property for other reasons. Could there be unowned bits of happiness lying around the way there were once unowned bits of real estate? 
following John Locke, shall we say, uh, that you may lay claim to a piece of happiness, but only if you make sure you leave enough and as good for others. From a moral point of view, it might be pleasant to believe that, uh, but a declining a piece of happiness is not a way of ensuring that it's there for someone else. All happiness is someone's happiness. The idea of happiness is an inherently relational idea. To say that your happiness is yours is not to say that you stand in a special relation to some piece of happiness that would otherwise be free-floating or belong to someone else. And if happiness is the good, that means that to say that something is good for you is not to say that you stand in a special relationship to something good that would otherwise be free-floating or belong to someone else. Now, of course, some people assert and some deny that happiness is the good. If this debate is about anything, uh, the term happiness must refer to something more specific than just whatever is good for someone. Many people think it refers, in particular, to the quality of our experiences and has something to do with their being pleasant rather than painful. Then people who deny that happiness is the good are protesting against the idea that all that matters is the quality of our experiences, while people who think happiness is the good are convinced that unless we experience something, at least indirectly, it can have no impact on us, whatever. But we don't need to enter into this familiar debate because everything I said before about happiness can also be said about pleasure. We can claim that what makes something good for you uh, is that it provides you with pleasant experiences. But that can't be what makes pleasant experiences themselves good for you. That little conundrum may drive us into an ownership theory of pleasure. Pleasure is a good thing, and what makes it good for you is that it is yours. But then again, we have to ask what the ownership consists in. Now here the tempting answer will be that you are the one who experiences it. But again, it's not as if there's some unexperienced pleasure lying around and being the one who experiences it is laying some sort of a claim to it. All pleasure is someone's pleasure. The idea of pleasure is an inherently relational idea. To say that your pleasure is yours is not to say that you stand in a special relation to some piece of pleasure. And if pleasure were the good, that would mean to say that something's good for you is not to say that, that you stand in a special relation to something good. And while we're at it, experience is relational too. To say that you're the one who has a certain experience is not to say that there is some experience to which you stand in a special relation. So what makes something good cannot be that you are the one who experiences it. Now that point is worth pausing over for two reasons. First of all, many of you are thinking now that I move just a little bit too quickly in dismissing the idea that what makes a pleasure yours is that you're the one who experiences it. The idea sounds tempting. And second, the positive theory I'm going to present later today is going to sound a lot like hedonism, as that view is usually conceived by utilitarians. It's going to emphasize the ex existence of experiences that involve valence, experiences that are positive and negative in their character. So I need to make it clear what I think is wrong with hedonism, at least as it's conceived by hedonistic utilitarians. Now, in one way, hedonistic utilitarians don't really propose to solve the problem of why there's such a thing as the good. They think that pleasure is the good. It's intrinsically good. And pain is the bad. And there are no further explanations for those facts. But in another way, I think hedonists are sensitive to the issues that make explaining the ideas of good and good for so difficult. When we're trying to think about what the good is, um, what makes hedonism tempting is the problem of valence. Pleasure and pain seem to be essentially valenced experiences. In fact, it's, it seems as if their whole nature is given by their valence. Pleasure just is positive experience, and pain just is negative experience, one might think. And when we try to think about it, what it means for something to be good for someone in particular, there seems to be an essential subjectivity to the notion. It seems impossible to think that something could be your good that you yourself would find wholly indifferent or unwelcome. But pleasure is welcome almost by definition. So it's tempting to locate the good 
in an essentially valence experience that is welcome almost by definition, and that's pleasure. So the hedonistic utilitarian, in other words, tries to capture the essentially subjective element of the final good, of good for, by attaching objective intrinsic value to a subjective experience. But when this move is made, the essentially relational character of the subjectivity in question drops out, tends to drop out. The goodness of the experience, what I, I'm saying, is detached from its goodness for the being who's having the experience, and instead is located in the character of the experience itself. This defect shows up most clearly when the hedonist moves on to utilitarianism, which allows us to add the goodness of pleasant experiences across the boundaries between persons or between animals. There is no subject for whom the total of these aggregated experiences is a good. So the aggregate good has completely lost its relational character. The goods are detached from the beings for whom they were supposed to be good. Now, although he wasn't a hedonist, Moore might have welcomed the implications of aggregation. He might have said that it shows that while the pleasure can be yours, its goodness cannot. But most utilitarians don't want that conclusion. They want the conclusion that your pleasures are good for you. What's gone wrong here, in my view, is that the hedonistic utilitarian conceives of pleasure as an object of experience rather than as a way we experience things, as something we're related to, rather than as a way we relate. I think that the grammar of experience talk is part of what misleads us here. For example, colloquially, we can speak either of the experience of loss or the experience of grief. The parallel structure suggests that grief and loss are on a footing two possible objects of experience. But of course, they're not on a footing. Grief, or as one might better say in my view, grievingly, is the way we experience loss. In my own view, grief is a form of rejection. And as such, it's the kind of pain we undergo when everything in us is in a state of massive rebellion against a personal loss. Now, to explain this remark, I need to rehearse an argument that I made in the sources of normativity. There are, in fact, two, or at least two, quite different conceptions of what pleasure and pain are. According to what I will call the Benthamite view, pleasure and pain are particular sensations, varying, um, as Bentham would have it, only in intensity and duration. According to the other view, which I will call the Aristotelian view, pleasures and pains are not sensations, but reflexive reactions to the things we experience. Specifically, they are reactions to the objects of experience as welcome or unwelcome, as to be accepted and, if possible, continued in the case of pleasure, and as to be fought off and, and if possible, to be stopped, as in the case of pain. Now, as the name I'm giving it suggests, the second view has a philosophical heritage in the views about pleasure and pain put forth by Aristotle in the Nicomachean Ethics, especially in the book 10 account. In the book 7 discussion, Aristotle identifies pleasure with activity, while in the book 10 discussion, he puzzles his readers by saying instead that it's something that supervenes on activity. He associates pain with something like obstacle or difficulty. Pain is the state you're in when the activity you're engaged in is too difficult or is too easy and therefore uh, boring or when you struggle to keep doing it, although something outside is distracting you. Pleasure is the state you're in when you're wholly absorbed in your activity and want it to go on forever. It's an advantage of the Aristotelian view that it can explain the plainfulness or pleasantness of things that are not necessarily accompanied by any particular sensation. Not only activities, but other forms of experience as well. Scraping your knee and breaking your heart are both painful. Taking a hot shower and reading a great novel are both among the pleasures of life. The hot shower and the scraped knee involve quite particular sensations. The broken heart and the great novel need not. 
In understanding the difference between these two accounts, it's important not to read the explanatory ambitions of the Benthamite view into the Aristotelian account. On the Benthamite view, pain and pleasure are sensations that we experience when we engage in certain activities, and we appeal to the character of those sensations in order to explain our reactions to the activities. For instance, when you count blades of grass, to use Rawls's famous example, you experience a sensation of boredom that then explains why you don't want to go on doing it. On the Aristotelian view, pleasure and pain are constituted by our reactions towards our activities, including the activity of having certain experiences. They don't explain those reactions at all. And on my view, this is all to the good, because in fact, pleasure and pain do not play any essential role uh, in the explanation of why we like or dislike the things that we do. What explains our reluctance to engage in the kind of activity that we call boring just is the fact that it's too familiar or too easy or too monotonous to engage our faculties. There is no need to say that those faculties cause a painful sensation of boringness, which then in turn explains why you don't want to engage in the activity. The appeal to the sensation here is completely odious. The familiarity, easiness, difficulty, or whatever it is causes the reaction directly. Boringness is our name for one way of finding an activity painful. And finding it painful and having an impulse to stop doing it are pretty much the same thing. Now, I think one thing that trips us up about this and gives the Benthamite view some specious plausibility is the fact that among the things we find painful or pleasant are having certain sensations. For sensations are among the objects of our experience. To take the philosopher's favorite, one can experience toothache. One can have that sensation. But on the Aristotelian view, the painfulness of that sensation is not the same thing as the sensation itself, nor is it an object of experience. That is, nor is the painfulness an object of experience, at least in the first instance. You can back off and think about it and make it an object of experience, but that's not essentially a sensation that's an object of experience. The painfulness of the sensation rests instead in the fact that everything in you is working to flee from an object, in this case a sensation, that you cannot possibly flee from because it's generated by your own nervous system. A person having painful sensations is like someone trying to escape from her own shadow. She's trying to tear herself free from a condition she cannot possibly escape without the loss of herself, precisely because it's a condition of herself. Pleasure and pain are not the objects of experience, but rather are a form of experience. They are the way we experience our condition, which is fundamentally evaluatively. In a sense, they are, as Aristotle says in the, on the soul, perceptions of what is good and bad. Now don't worry, I'll soon explain how I can say that and still be telling a story about the origin of the good. Okay, now I've been arguing that to say that something is your good cannot be to say that there is some good to which you stand in a special relation, a relation at which we gesture vaguely by saying that you are the one who has that good. I can imagine someone thinking that he can show that this form of argument must be wrong. Take the following comparison. If Aristotle is right in arguing that a dead hand is not really a hand at all, then every real hand must be someone's hand. Yet surely we can still say that what makes something your hand is that you're the one who has it. But no, actually we cannot, because there's still the problem of what the right kind of having consists in. I can imagine all kinds of macabre ways in which you could have a hand that would not make it yours in the sense we want here. You could have one on your closet shelf, for instance. Only when we hit on the right relation, the right kind of having, would the hand really be, by Aristotle's criterion, a hand at all. What this shows is that the condition of having a hand is prior to the hand itself. So the important point here is that everything that's good must be related to someone in a particular way before it can really be something good at all. That shows that the condition of having a good 
is prior to the good itself, or that something's being good for someone is prior to the good itself. Okay, so I'm therefore claiming that the notion of good for is more fundamental than the notion of good, and that for something to be a good is essentially for it to be related to something, someone in a particular way. But before I can say what that particular way is, I need to distinguish two apparently different things we might mean when we say that something is good for someone. Suppose that Alfred and Bertrand are competing for a position, and Alfred gets it. That, we say, is good for Alfred, but bad for Bertrand. Now, to be clear here, I'm not imagining that the position is one that Alfred and Bertrand want just because, say, it carries a good salary. I'm imagining it as a coveted position, one in which a person might engage in worthwhile activity and distinguish himself at the same time, a position that might serve as the basis of a good life. When we use good for Alfred in this kind of case, we're using it the way I've been using it up until now in this paper. We mean that getting a position will be the source of pleasure for Alfred or will make him happy or that it's part of things going well for him or that it's part of what makes his life good, a good one for him. We mean to put Alfred's getting the position in the same category of things in which hedonists put pleasure and eudaimonists put happiness, the category of things that are good for their own sakes or things that constitute such goods or contribute to them. To say that things are good in this sense is to mark out their relation to the things that would make sense for Alfred to go for, for their own sakes. So it's to mark their relation to Alfred's final good. So I'm just going to extend that category a little and call both final ends and the things that promote them final goods. On the other hand, when Alfred's mother informs him that broccoli is good for him, she does not mean to put broccoli in the same category in which hedonists put pleasure and eudaimonists put happiness. She does not mean that eating broccoli is part of the human good in the way that aesthetic experiences, happy marriages, and lives full of accomplishment and pleasure are parts of the human good. She does not mean that either broccoli itself or eating broccoli is a final good. It's possible that that's true, I suppose, but nevertheless, it's not what she means. She means, more or less, that broccoli is healthy and that it will make Alfred healthy. I'm going to call this, for now anyway, the motherly sense of good for, as opposed to the final sense. Now, you may be tempted to think that the difference here is just a matter of degree, a matter of how directly the thing in question benefits Alfred. Actually, there are two ways to hold this view corresponding to the two theories of pleasure that I just distinguished. A Benthamite hedonist thinks that pleasure, thought of as some particular kind of sensation, is the final good, and everything else is related to that final good causally. In that case, everything but pleasure itself is instrumental to the final good, and the uh, difference in degree in question here is a matter of instrumental or causal distance. Eating broccoli causes you to be healthy, which makes you capable of engaging in certain other activities, which in turn cause the sensation of pleasure. An Aristotelian hedonist, on the other hand, might think that the relationship between pleasure and activity is not one in which the activity causes a certain sensation, but one in which pleasure is somehow a characteristic of the activities themselves. Even so, the Aristotelian hedonist might think that the difference between the way in which pleasurable activities are good for you and the way in which broccoli is good for you is just a matter of how direct the benefit is. Dancing a waltz with a handsome partner is the sort of thing that constitutes the good for you directly. Well, eating broccoli is good for you too, but less directly. It promotes your health, which equips you for such activities as dancing waltzes with handsome partners. But there are two problems with the idea that what we have here is simply a difference in degree of the directness of the benefit. The first is that the kind of theories that make this way of thinking seem natural are exactly the ones that landed us in the quagmire we have just left behind. They leave nothing for the claim that pleasure or pleasurable activities or happiness uh, are themselves good for you to mean. 
On this theory, we would have to identify a final good as the thing that is most directly related to, well, to what? To your final good. And so we'd get stuck in a circle. So let's grant that the difference between saying that getting the job is good for Alfred in the final sense and that broccoli is good for Alfred in the motherly sense is not just a matter of how directly the thing in question benefits Alfred. What then is the difference? But you might still be tempted to say that even if we haven't yet figured out quite what we mean when we say that something is good for Alfred in the final sense, it's still clear that what we mean when we say that something is good for Alfred in the motherly sense is that it's instrumentally good, that it promotes some final good. And then we'll think that's what Alfred's mother is saying about eating broccoli. I don't think that's right, however, and this brings me to the second problem. According to the theory on offer, eating broccoli promotes Alfred's health, and Alfred's health in turn promotes his ability to engage in the kinds of activities that somehow constitute his final good. Now keep in mind the question is not merely whether all that is true, but rather whether it's what Alfred's mother is saying when she says that broccoli is good for him. That's what doesn't seem right to me. For suppose that Alfred's lover has left him to take up with Bertrand, and Alfred is feeling suicidal. Eat your broccoli, his mother urges. It's good for you. According to the theory on offer, Alfred should say, no, it isn't. Since all I want to do is die, the benefits of eating broccoli are completely irrelevant to me. Or maybe they're even bad, because they'll tend to keep me alive. But of course, that's not what Alfred is actually going to say. What he's actually going to say is, yes, it's good for me, but I don't care. Now, maybe you think this is just because Alfred is insufficiently reflective. And the use of the phrase, good for you, to mean something like promote your health, is so well established idiomatically that he fails to question the suitability of the claim to his own case. A more philosophical Alfred would say the first thing that his mother has made a wrong calculation about what will benefit him. But in my view, the second Alfred, the one I think the more likely Alfred, has got it right. Alfred is not explaining to his mother that she's made an error in calculation. He's declaring that being in despair, he doesn't care about himself, and so doesn't care about what's good for him. Good for you in the motherly sense of broccoli is good for you does mean something like promote your health and not something like promote your final good. The only problem is that promote your health is a little too specific, even for the motherly use of the phrase. For one thing, even in the motherly sense, we often generalize the idea to include psychological health. As when we say things like, it's precisely because you are so depressed that it would be good for you to get out and see people more. And even in the motherly sense, we sometimes generalize the idea even further to include moral and spiritual health. As when we say, for instance, you have been so successful that it's good for you to be taken down a peg now and then. But the problem is not merely that the proposed definition of the motherly sense of good for you as promote your health might be taken to be limited to physical health. It's also that, or so I claim, we can use the phrase in the motherly sense to talk about things that are not good by way of promoting, or at least not merely by way of promoting, anything at all. Now this point is a little harder to motivate, but let me give it a try. For one thing, I think we sometimes say, in the same spirit as Alfred's mother, that it's good for people to enjoy themselves sometimes, or to contemplate natural beauty, or to go to museums to appreciate art and learn something about the world they live in. These things are not mere means that promote some other state. Well, you may reply, that's no problem. Many things are both means and ends. When we say that these things are good for people in the same spirit in which Alfred's mother says broccoli is good for him, we mean that they promote people's psychological, moral, and spiritual health, and so are means. But when we say that they're good for people in the spirit in which we said it was good for Alfred, but bad for Bertrand, that Alfred got the position, we mean there are also ends. The motherly use of good for applies to the means to various kinds of health, while the final use of good for applies to ends, which as it happens, 
sometimes coincide with the means to various kinds of health. But I don't think it's quite that simple. For consider that in the resulting story, it's good for people to enjoy themselves sometimes, contemplate natural beauty, go to museums to appreciate art and learn something about the world they live in so that they can achieve a state which we call health, which in turn promotes their ability to enjoy themselves sometimes, contemplate natural beauty, and go to museums to appreciate art or learn something about the world they live in. What sort of a merry-go-round, you might ask, are we on here? Well, the answer, of course, is that it's the same sort of merry-go-round that the classical Greek philosophers, at least Plato and Aristotle, thought we were on with respect to the moral virtues. What the practice of moral virtue makes us capable of, according to Plato and Aristotle, is virtuous activity itself. In fact, for this very reason, both Plato and Aristotle frequently compare virtue to health. This comparison will help us to see that the problem here rests in the characterization of health itself as a means. In his book, The Practice of Value, Joseph Raz at one point suggests that health is a means to personal survival. No one survives, of course, but I suppose we could view health as a means to an extended life. Few people, however, wish for an extended life unless they can be assured of a reasonable degree of health. Do we then want health as a means to living a reasonably healthy life? Taking our cue from virtue, I think we can see that the right thing to say here is not that health is valued as a means to an extended life, but rather that it's valued as the excellence or the goodness of your physical life. Now, there are two reasons why this is the right thing to say. One is that it's very nearly a tautology to say that good health will extend your life, and claims about means are not normally tautologies. Although obviously health doesn't guarantee the extension of life, you can always get hit by a meteorite, we should not call a condition healthy if it didn't tend to extend or maintain life. The other, though, more important reason is that it explains the pair of judgments that I just mentioned that people try to be healthy in order to extend their lives, but only if their lives will be reasonably healthy ones. The explanation is simply that people want to extend reasonably good physical lives, but do not usually want to extend very bad ones unless there is some special reason for doing so. For of course, health can be a means to something in particular. If you want to survive long enough to finish writing your masterpiece, or to raise a late-born child to adulthood, say, but that thought is most natural when you've come to regard your physical life itself as a means to something in particular, to some other aspect of your life. But in the ordinary case, we don't think of health as a means to something, but rather simply as one form of the goodness of your life, namely the goodness of your physical life. When we generalize the motherly sense of good for to broader forms of life, to the psychological and the spiritual and the moral, then we're talking about the goodness of your life quite generally. In the motherly sense, when we say something is good for you, we mean that it either causes or constitutes your overall well-functioning in some dimension of your life. So does this mean that I'm suggesting, after all, that there's no difference between the final use of good for you and the motherly use of good for you? No difference between what Alfred's mother is saying when she says broccoli is good for him? And what we're saying when we said getting the position is good for him? Not quite. What I'm suggesting is that the final sense and the motherly sense of good for you in a way do mention the same set of facts, but from two different perspectives. From one of these perspectives, we're viewing Alfred as a functional system. That is, as an entity whose parts and lesser systems all contribute to the achievement of uh, some end or ends in some cases, simply to the maintenance and continuation of that functional system itself. From the other, we're viewing the things that are good for Alfred from Alfred's own point of view. It's because these two perspectives can come together that there's such a thing as the good. So let me explain what I have in mind. The association of the idea of good with the idea of a functional system goes back at least to Plato and Aristotle. To say that something is a good X, they believed, is to say that it has the properties that enable it to perform its function well. 
Here we're using good in the ordinary evaluative sense. A good knife is sharp, a good car is safe and gets good mileage, a good teacher is patient and attentive. Now, according to Aristotle, pretty much any substance or entity is a functional system. And this is because according to Aristotle, a substance or an entity is matter so organized as to serve some purpose or function to do something. Specifically, Aristotle taught us every entity can be analyzed as a form in a matter. The matter is the stuff or the parts of which the entity is composed, while the form is the arrangement of that matter or the parts that enables the entity to serve its purpose or to do whatever it characteristically does. Now, of course, this idea is clearest, or seems clearest, in the case of an artifact or a machine. A car is, say, engine, gas tank, chassis, wheels, organized in such a way as to form a guidable means of human transport, or something like that. The engine, gas tank, chassis, wheels, and so on, are the matter of the parts, or the parts, the form is that arrangement of those parts that enables the car to serve as a guidable means of human transport. In the case of an artifact, we identify the function or purpose of the entity in question by reference to our own purposes or that, those of its inventor. But Aristotle extended this basic idea that a substance is a functional system to living things by means of a thesis about what a living thing essentially is. A living thing is a substance so arranged as to secure the continuing existence of its own form. It does this, according to Aristotle, in two ways. Through nutrition, which enables it to preserve a continuing spatiotemporal stream of matter in its own arrangement or form, and through reproduction, which enables it to impose its form on other bits of matter. In other words, a living thing has a form that maintains matter in that very form. And that, according to Aristotle, is its function. A living thing functions well, essentially, when it manages to stay alive and reproduce. This metaphysical thesis does not imply that living things like artifacts were designed by a were created by a designer for the purpose of preserving themselves in their forms. Instead, it simply asserts that that's what a living thing is. We identify a certain bit of matter as a living thing or organism when it is so organized as to preserve its own form in these ways, when it has a self-maintaining or loosely homeostatic kind of form. Now, according to Aristotle, each kind of organism has its own specific ways of carrying out its nutritive and reproductive activities, and so its own form of life. And we can identify it simply as the substance that leads that form of life, or whose matter is organized in such a way that it maintains its form by living that form of life. So a dandelion is an entity that maintains its form through dandelion activities, such as spreading dandelion seeds on the wind, and a porcupine is an entity that maintains its form through porcupine activities, such as defending itself with quills. In each case, the function of the entity is simply to be what it is, to lead the kind of life that it characteristically leads. But we can also draw broad distinctions among types of life forms. Plants are the basic form of living organism, characterized simply by the powers of nutrition and reproduction. Animals, as Aristotle understands them, are characterized by an additional set of powers that determine the way they carry out the nutritive and reproductive functions, namely the powers of perception and action, where action is understood here basically as locomotion guided by perception. The idea of an animal, as Aristotle understands it, is the idea of an entity that preserves its form in part through its consciousness of its environment and its resulting ability to respond to envi its environment in ways that serve to maintain its form. The idea is not, of course, that the animal aims at the preservation of its form, if that's understood to mean that the animal consciously entertains such an end. Rather, the idea is just that the way the animal uh, functions involves having instinctive evaluative attitudes, desire and aversion, pleasure and pain, fear and interest, 
towards things that affect her own functioning. Now, in understanding these claims, it's important to understand the ramifications of the view of pleasure and pain that I described to you earlier. I'm not exactly saying that nature made animals capable of maintaining their own forms by providing them with experiences of pleasure and pain, with essentially valenced experiences. Instead, I'm saying that nature made animals capable of maintaining their own forms by providing them with instinctive impulses to go for the things that will help to preserve their forms and to avoid the things that threaten it. Pleasure and pain are in an animal's awareness of these impulses. Or rather, to put it a better way, they are the animals having these impulses consciously. The philosopher who is closest to saying something like this clearly, as far as I know, is Hobbes. In his book on human nature, Hobbes characterized pleasure and pain as the internal beginnings of animal motion towards or away from the things that affect the animal's vital motions or life processes. Hobbes didn't talk about consciousness in this context, but what he seems to mean is that pleasure and pain are the animal's awareness of those beginnings of internal motions. Or as I said before, they are the fact that the animal has those internal motions consciously. Pleasure and pain are not exactly valenced experiences. They are experiences of valence. Positive valence is the impulse to go towards something or to try to realize it or to make it keep going. Negative valence is the impulse to get away from something or to try to prevent it or to make it stop. Pleasure and pain are our consciousness of these tendencies. Or rather, as I said before, it's our having these tendencies consciously. I don't mean to imply, however, that pleasure and pain are epiphenomenal. Presumably, having these tendencies consciously enables the animal to exercise the tendencies in a way that's more refined and responsive to the environment. Nature did not need to invent valenced experiences in order to invent the good. She only needed to invent conscious action. It's the action that's valenced, but that valenced is experienced in animals that know what they're doing, or rather, to the extent that they know what they're doing. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Because it has the powers that make agency possible, Aristotle believed, an animal lives or has a life in a sense that a plant does not. Animals have experiences and they act, they do things in a sense that plants don't. It's natural for us to describe animals, even fairly primitive ones, as hunting, eating, mating, defending themselves and raising their young. But the capacities for feeling and action are not just powers added, so to speak, on top of the animal's nutritive and rep reproductive life. They're powers that exist in the first instance as the way the animal carries out the tasks of nutrition and reproduction that an animal shares with plants. The animal's capacity for action shapes the way she gets food and produces offspring. However, as a result of having these powers, animals also do things that plants don't do at all. They enjoy and suffer from their lives, and as a result, they may do other things that plants don't do, like, say, loving or playing. These facts make the life of an animal a very different sort of thing than the life of a plant. Aristotle also thought that human beings, as rational animals, formed a distinct third kind of being with a third kind of life. The capacity for rationality changes the way we carry out the functions we share with the other animals just as the capacity for action changes the way animals carry out the functions that they share with plants. And as in that case, it also adds to our repertoire of activities, expanding those to include such purely human activities as, say, the pursuit of scientific knowledge and philosophical inquiry and aesthetic activities. But the main change is that with rationality comes the power of choice in a distinctive way not shared by the other animals. Because a non-human animal's life is mapped out for her, at least broadly, by her instincts. And any two members of a given animal species basically lead the same sort of life, unless the differences are biologically fixed, as by age and gender, or by kinds, as among ants and bees. A human being, as a rational being, has a life in a different sense from this. 
for a human being has and is capable of choosing what we sometimes call a way of life, or following Rawls, a conception of the good. So rational nature, or personhood, introduces a new form of functioning, and so a new form of life. So in Aristotle's view, pretty much anything can be understood as a functional system. And considered as a functional system, it can be in good or bad shape. It can be good or bad in the evaluative sense. But it's not merely the case that functional systems are the sorts of things that can be evaluatively good or bad. It also appears to follow from the way in which functional systems can be good or bad that things can be good or bad for them in the motherly sense. Being driven once in a while is good for your car, while low quality gasoline is bad for it. Earthworms and rain are good for the soil, and fresh air and exercise are good for both you and your dog. If something is a functional system, the properties that enable it to perform its function well are the properties that make it a good one, and the conditions that tend to promote and protect those properties are good for it. So functional systems, by their very nature, have a good. They have a good in the motherly sense of having a good, in the sense in which broccoli is good for Alfred. Okay, now recall that I said that the motherly sense could be extended to talk about things that affect a person or an animal's psychological health or a person's moral and spiritual condition. From what we've now learned about their different kinds of functioning, this should not be surprising. Consider one of the examples I gave earlier. When we say, you have been so successful, is it, re it is really good for you to be taken down a peg now and then. Are we thinking of the person as a functional system? I think we are. The implication is that the buildup of self-satisfaction may eventually clog the person's moral arteries so much that it will interfere with his ability to keep on doing as well as he has. Now, if the idea of being good for something is linked to the idea of a functional system, where does the idea of a functional system come from? Does it name something we encounter and experience? A substance like water or a property like blue? It would seem not, because the idea is too deeply rooted in the way we see the world for that. As we've just seen, Aristotle thought for thing, that for a thing to be unified in the way that it has to be unified in order to count as a thing at all, as a substance, uh, is for it to be a kind of functional system. This makes the idea a metaphysically basic one. In the Critique of Judgment, Kant suggests speaking a bit roughly, that the exercise of reflective judgment, this is the kind of judgment we use to form concepts of the kinds of things that there are, as opposed to the kind we use to place objects under concepts we already have. So reflective judgment, or concept formation, involves interpreting some things as functional systems within the manifold of experience. Kant's idea is really the same as Aristotle's, with the characteristic Kantian twist of making the principle of substantial unity, functional unity, one that emanates outward from us rather than one that we encounter in nature. So understood, the idea of a functional system is one of those a priori concepts that I talked about in my first lecture. The problem that it solves for us is the problem about how to divide the sensible manifold into objects. If these ideas are right, then the idea of functional system is roughly what Plato called the form of the good, the organizing principle at the basis of all objects or our way of conceptualizing them. Except, of course, that something is not good absolutely, simply by virtue of being a functional system, even a functional system that's good or perfect of its kind. After all, a nuclear bomb or an assassin may be perfect of its kind. But a functional system is still the form of something, if what I've just said is right, uh, it's the form of having a good. To be a functional system is to be the kind of thing for whom or for which things can be good or bad. Now, all of that is still about having a good in what I've been calling the motherly sense, the sense in which good for you means something like enables you to function well. So now I'm going to switch from calling that good for you in the motherly sense to calling it good for you in the functional sense. 
Something is good for the, you in the functional sense if it maintains, promotes, or enhances your functioning. In order to get at good for you in the final sense, we need to recall the claims I made yesterday about the reason we use the concept of the final good. We use the concept of the final good to name the solution to the problem uh, with which you're faced as reflective agents. One of the problems with which you're faced as reflective agents, namely the problem of what to go for, of what ends to pursue. This brings me back, finally, to the puzzle I started out from. Why do we use the same word, good, to talk about positive evaluation and to talk about what we aim at in life? Now we can ask the question this way. Why do we use the word good when we're talking about the success of functional systems and when we're talking about the things we've decided to go for? There seems to be a curious sort of interdependence between two ideas that are at work here, the idea of a functional system and the idea of an agent. When we regard an object as a functional system, we're regarding it rather as if it were a kind of agent and the purpose that it serves as if it were an end that it had decided to go for. It's as if behind the division of the world, our division of the world into objects lurked a primitive form of animism, a determination to view the world as being full of agents like ourselves. But then again, when we view ourselves as agents, we view ourselves in turn as functional systems. Because to be an agent is to be essentially subject to a standard of success and failure, and to be subject to a standard of success and failure in the very same way that a functional system is. Here's what I have in mind. A functional system, let's say a machine, is designed to achieve a certain end. If it doesn't achieve its end, we say that it has failed. You were late this morning, you say, apologetically, because your alarm clock broke down and failed to go off. But to be successful, it's not enough that your alarm clock goes off from any cause, whatever. If the alarm rings because a sudden jolt of electricity happens to break a spring, which accidentally hits the mechanism that sets off the bell at 7 o'clock exa exactly, it is not a good clock. A functional system, to be successful, has to be the kind of thing that reliably achieves its end. In the same way, the kind of success we associate with agency is not exhausted by the idea of an agent actually bringing his end about. Since an agent who brought about his end only accidentally, say by a deviant causal pathway, would have failed as an agent. If I fire my gun wildly astray, but the bullet ricochets off a cast iron fence and happens to hit the target in exactly the spot I intended, I have not made a good shot. To be successful in action is not merely to do something that brings about your end. To be successful in action is to make yourself into the kind of thing that reliably achieves that end. So to regard yourself as an agent is to regard yourself as a functional system. And to regard yourself as a functional system is to regard yourself as having a good, in the functional sense of good. But now it's not only the functional sense of good. Because if you regard the thing you aim at as a final good, as something worth going for, then you regard the things that promote it, your own condition concluded, included, as good in that way too. An agent necessarily values his own functional good. Now this puts us in a position to see why there are things that have a, final, that have a good in the final sense. When we regard an organism as a functional system, we regard its end as being, as I said earlier, something along these lines. To maintain itself, to survive and reproduce, or to live the life characteristic of its kind. The end of an organism, in a sense, is simply to be and continue being what it is, or as I put it elsewhere, to constitute itself. Now, if the organism is an agent, roughly speaking, an animal or a person, the way that she constitutes herself is in part by having impulses that track, at least roughly and feasibly, what is good or bad for her in the functional sense. And if those impulses are conscious, that means that she experiences evaluative states. In other words, an animal that's to have any chance of surviving must feel hungry when she needs food, 
fear in the face of predators and threats, and pain in the face of conditions that are damaging to her. She must perceive what's good for her as attractive and what's bad for her as aversive. And those perceptions must play a role in determining what she decides to go for and what to avoid. As we've already seen, there are organisms that function in exactly this way. They're animals. If the organism is also a rational agent, then she'll do some of this self-consciously, using the word good to designate the things that are good for her in the functional sense when she decides to pursue them. She conceives the things that are good for her to be good things in the final sense, and as such, she decides to go for them. This is not because, as it happens, she cares about herself and values her own well-functioning. As we've seen, agents necessarily value their own well-functioning. So it's just because of the kind of thing that she is. Before I said that the motherly, or what I'm now calling the functional sense of good for you, and the final sense of good for you, name the same set of facts from two different perspectives. In one, we view the entity as a functional system, and in the other, we view the things that are good for the entity from the entity's own point of view. I've now explained why that is so. Animals perceive, and rational animals also conceive, what is good for them as something to go for, and so what is good in the final sense. What is functionally good for them in the broad sense I've been describing is also good from their point of view, and so is their final good. So why is there such a thing as the final good? There's such a thing as the final good because there are beings for whom things can be good. Things can be good for them because they're functional systems, and their way of functioning involves experiencing their own well-functioning and the things that cause it as attractive and their own ill-functioning and the things that cause it as aversive. Speaking roughly, there is such a thing as the final good because there are animals. But tomorrow, I'm going to look more closely at the question, what sorts of things can have a good, as well as, in some cases, what kinds of things are good for them. Thank you. Uh, one of your arguments do not work on me at all, even though the presupposition it rests on uh, is shared by me and a minority only. And it has to do with what comes on the first uh, page about pleasure in the middle of the, the page. Next suggestion, what makes something good for you is that it gives you pleasure. Question, then what makes making then what makes pleasure good for you? Reply, the fact that you are the one who experiences it. Counter reply, what makes an experience yours? Having an experience is not standing in a special relation to some independently existing experience. All experience is someone's experience. To me, this works for, in a broad sense, may be called nominalist uh, philosophers, people thinking that in this the spatio-temporal world contains nothing but particulars of them. Uh, so I happen to belong to the minority who think in order to understand the world, we have to postulate universals as well. Aristotle was uh, uh, among them, <coughs> or the central one, of course. But this means if I have a pain sensation, it's painful to me because it's mine. But it instantiates a universal, and that means everyone else who has the same universal, pain universal, instantiated, has a bad, a painful experience. Therefore, there is an entity in my pain sensations, apart from it being mine, and that is, so to speak, the pain as a universal. You see my point? I'm not sure I do. Um. Oh, OK. I've been too much in this with uh, nominalism and uh, <coughs> universalism. I think it's a good argument against all the utilitarians who really are nominalists. And I think the majority are. So I'm not I'm saying that's, uh, uh, that you are wrong. I'm saying it does not function. This argument does not function on me.
Um, well, the point of the argument is to emphasize that all these states, which utilitarians and their ilk pick out as that's the thing that's the good, are actually relational states. Yeah. The point of the From argument is to show that it's good for us. I have a relation to a universal and to a particular. There is a particular mind pain sensation. And if so speak, mind cannot be uh, taken away from me. Uh, it can't float into someone else. I can't transfer uh, a pain well, I, in my I hand into Björn's, <laughs> Björn's hand. But nonetheless, if you accept universals, then there is a shift in the way you have to think about it. Then there is an entity that might be in several places even at the same time. Therefore, the same kind of pain that I, oh, that continue with Bjorn. I have a pain in my hand, you have a pain in your hand, they are of exactly the same kind. Then for me, there is a universal, an entity, a certain very specific kind of pain sensation in a hand. And well, that's now, you both keep in saying, me and in Bjorn. You keep saying pain sensation, yes. but part of the argument in the, when I went through about the way we conceive of pleasure and pain is that I think sensations are among the things we can find painful, but I don't think that pain is a sensation. Okay. I think that I pain think is that a response. I think that also rests on nominalist assumptions, but let end. But may I, may I just put forward a, a, a little amusing question? You uh, told a little narrative about uh, Bertrand and Alfred. <laughs> now, I happen to know, I have read, if my memory is not completely wrong, that when Alfred North Whitehead and Bertrand Russell together, worked together for many years, wrote the famous Principia Mathematica. They worked in Whitehead's house, and the stories say that Whitehead's wife and Russell fell a bit in love with each <laughs> other, even though it never turned out to a, a real relationship. Were you alluding to this? Yes. Yes. Now, tell, uh, can't you tell the audience the truth and me the truth about this story? You I, must do, I don't know the truth about the oh, story. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I know the truth about the story. <laughs> well, uh, I was also thinking, of course, you were thinking about Alfred and Bertrand, but uh, Ingvar said uh, that they, uh, Evelyn and Bertrand, were, were in love with each other. That's not true. Russell was in love with Evelyn. But, uh, and that was the big problem for him. But uh, I had another question. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, no, no, please. Okay, it's a quick one. When you, Aristotle to distinguish between uh, dead and living matter, and then finally uh, human beings, you said he needed perception and action. But wasn't there a third element he added? You, you needed contemplation, you needed an instance to uh, evaluate what you perceived. Uh, um, as I understand it, for animals it's just perception percept action, that's just perception guided locomotion. Yeah, but um, for human beings. For human beings, yeah, human beings are rational animals, so yes. They human needed the third element, which yeah. he called contemplation. Right. Yeah, right. okay, yes. that was yeah. Well, thank you. I'm interested in this uh, final sense of, uh, of good for, not the motherly sense. And then, if I understood you uh, correctly, the answer is that um, what's good for me is uh, what I am to go for, roughly, right? So the relation to myself is uh, Precisely that one, that this is me who, who is the agent of, uh, of the going for, right? Uh, and that's certainly one interpretation of what good for me could uh, mean. But then there's another interpretation, and I, I'm not sure that this is the motherly interpretation. So the interpretation on which uh, if something is good for me, then if this something is realized, then I, I am thereby better off. And of course, on your account of final good, there is no such uh, 
automatic implication, right? I, there are things that are for me to go for, but uh, that are not going to make me better off, right? Um, can you give me an example? Well, so when I consider what am I to go for, let's say, if I were parfit, I would say, I am to go for saving of, the, of Venice, right? <laughs> this is not going to make me better off, right? But uh, Venice will be <laughs> made better off, right? Uh, uh, so, so there are various goals that I, I could have, uh, but uh, that have nothing uh, to do with my well-being. So okay. Um, I will be talking about this more specifically tomorrow when I say something about what's special about the human good. Because I think what you're talking about is something, human is good. a way in which things can only be good for people. Okay, so I don't think anything could be good for an animal in the way, a non-human animal in the way that you're describing. Okay, but anyway, this is not what you suggest that what is finally good for me is the same as what is uh, my human good or something like this, what, is, uh, what constitutes my well-being. Um, I do think it's the same. Then, I do think then, it's the same. Then we are on, on, on opposing sides. <laughs> um. <laughs> Yesterday I put forward a thought experiment uh, to you about a child just living for 10 seconds in an, uh, intense pain than uh, dying. What is, is she, someone or a person? Now comes a similar question. <coughs> uh, I understand your talk about functional systems and so on. What, what about this kind of functional system? <coughs> it's like we human beings, we are conscious doing things. Uh, conscious of having goals, having in one sense desires, but when <coughs> the, the desire or the goal is uh, satisfied, well, the organism does not become sad, does not suffer, only completely neutrally notices, oh, oh shit, oh, it, it, can't, it can't, even, can't even say shit, it just notices, <laughs> no, I fail, and when it goes well, it, in an equally neutral way, simply tells itself, yeah, I succeeded. No pleasure, no pain, just living a completely neutral but conscious life. Can you fit such a peculiar kind of organism into your uh, moral philosophy, or the kind of things you talked about here? Um, I think that it may be the case that pleasure and pain uh, are, and other conscious states, are further up along a kind of scale with simple reactivity. So there could be a creature that's just sort of reactive. Um, but that, on this view, would be sort of like the primitive origins of consciousness itself. But it wouldn't be, you know, any, it wouldn't experience the kind of things that uh, organisms with more advanced forms of consciousness do. Now, would that be your kind of case? No, I said you, the, uh, there is no, I take it as you are saying, yes, that such organisms have no final good. Um, I am. Oh, now you see my question. Yeah. Do they have a final good? Such? I think that in such organisms it's uh, very difficult to distinguish their final good from their functional good, that the distance between those two things is less. Even infinitesimal. But there is a difference. But it's, it's the difference, so to speak, zero. But that you want to have a, well, a small little difference it, even it there. Has, it has a small final good if it says to itself, I did it. Yeah. yeah. But in general, um, I think the idea of a sort of completely neutral consciousness is, is a really strange one. Um, you know, I, th I think that um, 
evaluativeness is just that consciousness is shot through with it. Um, it's not, you know, that you're just sort of representing the world like something's passing on a screen and you're taking it in and then once in a while you have a reaction to it. One of the things that I think people just forget to think about is that even in our most sort of theoretical moments, when we might describe ourselves as just thinking about things and not reacting to them in any particular way, something at least has to direct our attention to one thing rather than another. And that has to be some primitive form of interest. You know, even if it's not, ah, oh, I find that so interesting, nevertheless, you know, you sort of have to attend to one thing rather than another, because if everything just flowed in on you, and it was all sort of on a par with each other, you couldn't think. So, I mean, I think even theoretical consciousness has to be evaluatively directed. So the idea of a non-evaluative consciousness is, is just a bizarre one. Yeah, I was wondering actually with, in connection to that, because uh, the, the way you're talking about uh, how we have to understand things animistically in, in a way, um, uh, how exactly how necessary do you think that that is? Is this, because um, it seems to me that it's basically developing the, the Kantian causality understanding and, and then uh, just to, to, to make it clear, do you think that we can conceptually understand anything as not being a part of a, of a, of a uh, functional system in that way? Um, I think that we have to start out dividing up the world along the lines of functional systems. So we start out, as we do, thinking of the world as made of plants and animals and things, objects, machines, artifacts, furniture. Um, so, uh, but of course, the scientific endeavor uh, kind of aims at driving the functionality sort of out of the functional systems as far as possible. Um, and so it aims at providing us with something like a neutral representation of the world. Um. Is that, is, do you think that's possible? Because it's basically the question of like, um, so if, if we have to understand everything as cost, is it, is it you know, at all, we, th there we can dispute with the physicists about the first cost and all that kind of stuff. Um, do you think that it's conceptually possible for them to be successful in their endeavor to do no, that? I no, I don't. I uh, don't. Because I think that um, our representation of the world, it's a little hard to talk about this stuff, but I think that our representation of the world has to be, no matter how neutral it is, in a certain way relative to our, our needs as cognizers, which are particular needs. You know, you can imagine a different kind of cognizer. Um, so uh, I don't think there is such a thing as a completely neutral representation of the world. And of course, that's just a way of saying again that we don't have knowledge of things as they are in themselves. We have knowledge of things as they relate to us in our cognitive equipment. So this is a related question, actually, also arising from this animistic point. Um, have you considered any relationship here to like, Dennett's view on intentional stance as a way of the way we interpret intentionality and rationality in, in functioning systems or, or humans, um, as if there's any relation in your view to, to that kind of view? Well, um, the view I have is similar to Den's view in the sense that if you take the Kantian view about the, w the role that the idea of a functional system plays in dividing up the world, uh, it's interpreting that thing as something that in a way emanates out from us rather than merely recording facts about it. So it, it's a standpoints view, the way Dennett's view is. Um, the roots of it in my thinking are, are in Kant rather than in Dennett, but they, there is that similarity between the two views, kinds of views. Uh, right, and so this might be most preempting on tomorrow's lecture, but is there a way here we get to, for example, artificial, uh, artificial creatures, or artificial intelligence, and having final goods through this? Um, I have n no problem with that at all. Um, it, especially if you take the view that I mentioned before, 
and I'm not saying I would know how to defend this view, but that there really is a continuity between reactivity and what we call representation or perception. If you believed something like that what we call representation is just very, very nuanced <laughs> reactivity, then certainly there is no reason why you couldn't build a machine that would be conscious. Um, and since I just said this other thing about how consciousness sort of has to take an evaluative form that would have evaluative states. And after all, that has to be possible because that's what nature did, is build machines that were conscious and have evaluative states. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't have any problem with that possibility. Thanks. Because, well, yesterday I asked this question, how do you understand this uh, this question, what to go for? What am I to, to go for? And so you said that you will explain that. So can, uh, is it something that you will explain later? Or? Um, you mean what I mean by saying yes, what to right. go for? Uh, so you, uh, because otherwise, kind of, there is this suspicion that, that one could say, well, this question already involves a normative element, so evaluative element. What is it that is worth going for, or what, or what should I go for? And then, then the question already assumes those notions, uh, maybe that you, are, you, you try to well, explain. Well, right? the idea that I was um, trying to express today mm -hmm. is that valence is actually a feature of the actions rather than something about conscious sensation that explains the action. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I uh, was emphasizing that the Aristotelian theory of pleasure doesn't inherit the explanatory ambitions of the Benthamite theory of pleasure. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not that we have sensations that then explain why we go for things. It's that we tend to go for things and we do that consciously. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that form of consciousness is an evaluative form of consciousness. Um, Okay, but that I understand. So there are actions of attractions and there are actions of aversion, so mm -hmm. to speak. So there is a valence in responses. In yes. But it still doesn't explain this uh, question, what am I to go for? What am I to act in this attractive <laughs> way? Though? What does it mean, though, this question? Um. Okay, I'm, there, there's something I'm not getting about well, let, what you're asking. Well, I mean, uh, in the case of human beings, yeah, well, of course, suppose we, we I, decide, I, I, we, we set our ends at, in the course of setting our actions. We decide what, what ends we're going to go for. As I said, the question is interlocked. Yeah, well, that's precisely, it's perfect. We ask them, ourselves this kind mm -hmm. of question. What should I do? What mm -hmm. am I to do? But then there's always this issue what does this question mean? And one interpretation of the, the question is that this is really a question that involves uh, uh, some uh, normative judgment, right? That it's a question of uh, what is worse to do in a given situation, or what should, what ought I to do, or something like this. But then those normative, uh, notions are already assumed in the question. So then the question of, th that would mean that this notion of final good would be really a notion that is shot through and through by this normativity that comes from the, from the formulation of the question. Well, I certainly don't, I'm, I'm not one of those people who thinks there's a difference between the question, what to do and what should I do okay. for human beings. Mm -hmm. That there's no that there's no difference exactly. for human beings. Right. Um, but I am trying to show why the question, what to do, uh, as it sort of appears in the animal mind, because animals do have moments in which they decide whether to go this way or that way, or whether to go get something to eat, or whether to fight or retreat, um, why that is already 
kind of a normatively loaded or evaluatively loaded question for them. Obviously, they don't say, what should I do? But what they do is determined by evaluative reactions and perceptions. But the animals, well, as you said, they don't make a choice, right? That's the human capability. So it's the, the humans that ask themselves this question, what am I to do, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, the, so, but then, then if that's the situation, then it seems to me that the kind of answer that you are giving to the question of what is final, the final good is on the, side, on the line of, you know, final good is what is uh, calls for what, what is worth uh, uh, a positive response. Right? It's a, this sort of fitting uh, response uh, analysis of the question. Of, of this of this notion um, I don't think it follows from the fact that we ask ourselves what should I do that there have to be facts independently of what we ourselves value oh, that true. guide us I, I think it's consistent with that to say I, that all I value arises agree. from valuing um, and, and in a way, the story I told today was just a story about how do valuing, how does value appear in the world? The answer is mm -hmm. valuing appears in the world. Why does valuing appear in the world? Because valuing appears in the world in the first instance because there are entities whose whole business mm -hmm. is to look after themselves. Yeah. You know, I mean, animals are things that, they're like, they're things. Animals, are, we are things. We're objects. We're substances. We take care of ourselves. It's a sort of extraordinary. <laughs> People forget to be struck by it. But it's because there are these kinds of things in the world, yeah, things yeah. that look after themselves, that there's value and normativity. That's how it gets into the world, with things that look after themselves. Thank you. Okay. Uh, should end the, the discussion here and continue tomorrow. Thank you. Well, here there's a normative element in the analysis. This has to do with the should. And there's a response element in the analysis going for, not attitudinal element as in, let's say, in you win, but scan on so both about attitudes and uh, behavioral responses. Um, the fact that the animal's responses are fitting mm -hmm. just spring from what the, from the kind of thing the animal is. Yeah, it could very well be the case, right? Yes, of course. So the kind of the ground for the supervenience base, let's say, for for the pitiness, well, that's another another matter. That's not the part of the analysis. That's a substantial theory of of the of the good, right? Not the conceptual analysis of the good. Um, I'm not inclined to separate these things <laughs> in the way that the fans of meta-ethics uh -huh. uh, do. I'm inclined to think that our theory of why there mm -hmm. is such a thing as the good has direct implications for what is good. For what is okay. Um, so there's no <laughs> common ground, would you say, in that here there's a certain concept of good, final good that is shared by, by people from very many different positions. Right? Well, I take it that the, the thing that's shared mm -hmm. is the thing, I, this is when I was talking in the first day about problems and solutions, mm -hmm. the thing that's shared is the idea that the final good is what solves the problem of what to go for. Yes, yes. That's the thing that's shared. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I'm just wondering because uh, what you're saying basically that uh, the uh, 
valuing valuing is our acting our our acting is as conscious uh, cost as our own self <laughs> it, it, it is valuing uh, but uh, I, we just heard him um, when you're talking about animal uh, non-human animal uh, acting it's because obviously they aren't uh, aware of their causality uh, or at least not most of them right uh, uh, so do they because I had the thought that f for us to be aware of our we have to we have to view something as as good uh, or, or for us in some way. But their they 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 their act act acting then can couldn't be the same as uh, this, this acting in the same sense that we are acting them. So well, I, in self constitution, mm -hmm. I lay out a rather elaborate theory of what animal action is. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, 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 and try to say what it has in common with our acting. Yeah, yeah. Um, and what it doesn't. So yes, I agree. It's not exactly the same. Mm, uh, so, but just uh, so when when we then say that um, good for animals is what what what's good from that system perspective, that functioning as a system, that that is we us saying that. That is that is the way we must view that. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, then that was what I thought you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I think um, part of the story here, uh, and this is a story that I told some of in Self-Constitution, haven't talked about it in these lectures, uh, has to do with the transition from, um, I describe animals as having teleological perception yeah. in Self-Constitution so that they see things really as to go for in yeah. various ways to be eaten, to be mated with, to be flat run from, you know, to, to be avoided, uh, that that's all sort of built into their view of the world. And that means that um, for animals, there isn't a theory practice split at all. There's just the world is practically interpreted all the way down. And one of the things that happens with reason is we make the theory practice split, and that's what starts to make deliberation look really different yeah. for us than it does for the other animals, is, is the breakdown of teleological perception that comes with the ability to question what teleological perception is telling you. Yeah. You know, I mean, all of a sudden, and, you know, you can say to yourself, because you're aware, you know, that you have an impulse to run, yeah. you can say to yourself, well, should I? Should I run? Do I go with this or not? Um, and then... And that is my question, I guess. <laughs> because, uh, I mean, depending on where you go, I suppose, you could either... I mean, you start get, getting worried at this point. Because either it's not, you know, natural history enough, or it's not enough magic going on, in a way. So that this theory practice play, or this, you know, the um, introduction of rationality, either something happens at that point, which really transforms what we've been doing, which up until this point has been, you know, philosophy as natural history, <laughs> and then all of a sudden we uh, bring in this issue, this idea of choice or deliberation, <coughs> rationality or whatever, and then all of a sudden. It doesn't seem like what's going on at that point has that much to do with this teleological worldview of animals. Well, um, so basically, how do you go from two to three in your list? That's <laughs> that, what, what happens? It's a huge it's question, and you know, this is it's been raised a lot before now, but it's yeah, yeah. um, I. I th I think it is true that a complete natural history of value would have to explain the origin of reflective yeah. self-consciousness. Um, and that's a big thing to explain. Um, but I do want to say, and this is why I was starting to say the thing about the theory practice split, that the story of the origin of reflective self-consciousness will be a story of something that happens to animal consciousness, uh, and it'll be something that carries with it 
the way in which evaluative stuff found its way into animal consciousness. So it, the story will still be, I mean, it'll, it'll still be natural, it would be natural history if you had it worked out because it would still say that value found its way in the world starting with the existence of things that look after themselves and then finds its you know, rational form with the existence of things that look after themselves in the particular way uh, that um, rational beings do. So, but I admit, I can't tell the whole story because I can't tell the part exactly of how the rational consciousness came into existence. I've made a couple of stabs at it. There's a paper called uh, Reflections on the Evolution of Morality uh, in which I tried my hand at it, but uh, it's not a complete account.